In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Good Counsel, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We have not let hell rest, have we? Hell has been trembling all afternoon and morning. All is good. Okay, as a little bit of a recap, um, I just wanted to uh, make that trip together uh, that we started out the time with um, just the consideration that we've been asked to do uh, during this retreat, and that is to see the inseparable uh, connection link relationship between Mary and the Eucharist, the golden gifts. And so we spoke a little bit, alluded a little bit to, to how scripture uh, helps us to see that and how uh, the clergy helps us to use scripture uh, to unfold uh, this mystery, which is deep and wide, but not unknowable to at least a certain extent. And so there's gratitude all around when we consider all of these things that Mother Church uses to help us uh, know more and, and love more and serve more. And then we utilized a, a great gift also just of how God created us to really imitate him in creating things uh, in the form of art and how we know art is, the word says, speaks a thousand words at times. So I, I it was a joy for me because of course, I have the ability to be speaking a little bit and kind of just sharing a little bit of my reflections on my own as I'm going through the retreat with you. I'm, I'm alongside you in this. and um, But others that had some time with me were able to share some very rich experiences with uh, Visio Divina. So maybe it'll happen at, at uh, the dinner hour. I don't know, hopefully at the tables at least, that you'll learn a little bit. Uh, I will leave these up again until I leave, so if you haven't had a chance to spend some time before one of these beautiful images, please do. And then um, we talked about Mary and her relationship in the Mass, trying to prepare ourselves to uh, enter into a Mass, maybe with uh, having a little bit more knowledge and love of Mary's relationship to the Mass. And then... Um, we talked about how Mary leads us to Eucharistic adoration, where often uh, the great lie of the evil one is to say that she actually is bringing people to her, and we know that not to be true. So anyway, hopefully your adoration hour was a little bit richer because of just a little bit of a sensitivity to that. So how do we put an amen onto this? Well, we really don't ever end what we're trying to reach but it's just another topic I would have to say. So it's not like the very last topic that one would do to um, learn about Mary as she relates to the Eucharist. But this last topic, uh, I think, will kind of launch us uh, homeward. So we had topics I thought would launch us into particular parts of the retreat. And this one uh, puts us back on the road, and puts our noses in the direction of home. And hopefully you'll have a little bit more to think about as well. This one is a conference that regards how Mary relates, uh, the Mary and the Eucharist and the church all have a relationship. So hopefully it'll be something that'll be clear by the end of um, half an hour or so. But we honor Mary as what? As the mother of the Eucharist. And I think the, the tape alluded to that. I think Father maybe even in his homily spoke a little bit about that as well. But my, she's the mother of the Eucharist, and so she's mother of, church, of the church as well. And they're very intertwined. And so in order to kind of unfold that, what I was brought to was to look at the defining moments in Mary's lives that Scripture tells us about. So we are going to unfold a bit of Scripture in, in this way. And so the four defining moments, I would say, that link these two roles together, mother of the Eucharist and mother of the church, are the Annunciation, uh, the wedding at Cana, her time at Calvary, and then where our hearts are headed right now, Pentecost. So those are the things, and in just a nutshell, um, I'll 
kind of open things up and then please add your own notes as you're gaining some your own lights on this. So the first one, the Annunciation. So Mary's faith, Mary's fiat was rewarded with the incarnation. And it's something that's so pivotal in your life, my life. Uh, and, and, and art kind of gets folded into this as well, that famous picture of the couple that stops in the field to pray the Angelus, right? So it's, it's the commemoration of the Annunciation done midday and kind of helps form the rest of the day for Catholics, right? The Angelus bells that ring. Do, are some of you in places where Angelus bells ring still or no? Do you know what I'm talking about? So at 12 noon, the Angelus Bell, 6 o'clock. Yeah, yes, no? Okay, good. And so um, this is something my in my son's parish, he he started it because he just felt like this, we're gonna <laughs> remind people, you know, what why we rang the bells before. We're gonna ring them again. And and he'll answer the questions as they come in. So I think it's a beautiful um not visual in this case, but something that, that's audible, that reminds us to stop what we're doing and, um, and, and commemorate uh, that great pivotal moment of history. And um, I know one time when our son was in the college seminary, my husband and I stopped by with, I don't know, a couple of trays of cookies or something. And it was, you know, right before they were gonna have lunch, but we were a little bit later than we thought we were gonna be. And, and the end, all of a sudden we heard the, the men singing, Angelus, you know, and they were just like singing this as if they were bells. And that, so we were, we were able to witness that beautiful thing that happened, you know, behind the closed doors of the college seminary. So um, I, it, it just still, I can still hear the, the guys doing that. And it, was, uh, it ha had to be formative to their seminary life. So in the Eucharistic mysteries, the words of consecration also beckon the same word that came to, to Mary. And so we're having that echo. Uh, we talked a little bit about that already of uh, the word made flesh under the direction of, of the priest. He, uh, God uh, obeys the priest. God becomes flesh at the word of the priest. The very... Um, it's good to just realize that and to kind of let that soak in and how we honor our priests or even dishonor our priests, right? So um, we owe our Eucharistic meals, our Eucharistic sacrifices, all of this uh, to the priest. Cana. So this is a place where Mary's faith uh, encouraged her son's first miracle, right? Jesus was... It seems like in scripture, maybe he's a bit hesitant as to, to go forward, but um, it's his will and he's willing this to happen, but it, and it does happen. His first miracle happens and then it launches him into his ministerial life. So there's a couple of things going on here that I think are quite lovely when we look at the mother of the Eucharist and the mother of the church. The first one, the foreshadowing of water turning into wine of course, is, is the wine uh, turning into blood. So this, this is the foreshadowing on this image here in the art. Um, you know, we can see possibly the urn at Cana being depicted here, uh, which could also be, as I said, the urn of St. Mary Magdalene, which is, is connecting Jesus to the actual sacrifice that allows the blood uh, to come forward at Mass. Another thing, though, that I, as I was uh, considering this, is that perhaps it also is uh, foreshadowing something else. So here we are, it, it's a wedding feast. And those of, of, of us that have uh, had our own wedding feasts, we know all the details. Uh, we're thinking about them, even at our own wedding, perhaps, that all the details would come into place. And, and it would be quite a panic if your wine, which was... Uh, something that was uh, esteemed in your culture uh, was not available. So somehow relatives, whether they're relatives or not, or how that all came about where Mary was made privy to that, um, 
it would have been something that would have saved face for this couple. And so it was a great gift of, of recognition and, and also uh, something that needed action. And she felt like Jesus could provide that. But it is, it is a wedding that we're, that we're at, the simple wedding of Cana. So, of course, this is a foreshadowing itself of the Mass. The, the bride and the groom, uh, 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 the groom, the bridegroom Christ and his bride, the church, coming together. And, of course, uh, in heaven, it will be the, the marriage feast of the Lamb. So, it's almost this triple foreshadowing, this echoing of what is happening, but seeing Mary as central in all of this, mother of the Eucharist and, and mother of the church. Seems like it's this ever-broadening vision of not just an event that was a defining moment for Mary, but it's an event that continues to define her role in the church and um, her role in the heavens. Okay, the third one is Calvary. And this one we probably have spent the most time with. The church asks us to linger, actually has a liturgical season where we are slowed down to really consider all that Mary uh, was about. Um, and the Good Friday uh, darkness of Mary, uh, again, uh, uh, pointing to where she was at the foot of the cross. And um, Again, it's a foreshadowing. Um, she's being commissioned by Jesus himself uh, to be the mother of us all, right? In a, in a way, he commissioned her to be a mother, a special mother, a special relationship with uh, John, who was a virginal priest. He was a young priest, bishop. Uh, and uh, it, it's a beautiful thing where he's giving his mother to him in a special way as well. He's representative of us, but more especially, he's representative of the priests. And so there's a very special relationship that um, the heavens that have asked of Mary in the church. So again, mother of the Eucharist, yes. Mother of the church, yes. Okay. So Mary at the cross is being appointed as the mother of the nascent church, the, the baby church, the new church, now being symbolized by the blood and the water that's issuing forth. And one thing that I thought about that, even though we, the church, I don't think is, has a fine line on this, but it's, uh, Mary was, is virginal. She, she was virginal. So it wasn't a natural birth. It was some kind of a, supernatural birth. We're not sure how she had her virginity intact, but perhaps there was blood and water that issued forth during whatever type of birth she had. I know if you watch The Chosen, <laughs> I've written letters to The Chosen about this. They depict her birth very differently than Catholics believe. And um, so the thing is, when I was considering how the blood and water uh, issuing forth from the pierced side of her son, it's, it's upon her. And, and is it a kind of a, uh, an echo of the natural birth, the blood and the water, which, which may or may not have gushed forth, but at least it was present if she, uh, and we know she had a baby. So it was there. And so there is a foreshadowing of sorts, I think, with a natural and a supernatural birth sacramental birth and the natural birth. So again, the blood and the water ushering forth are baptismal waters and the blood of the sacrificial uh, Jesus Christ. So our baptism and our Eucharist, again, hearkening to Mary as mother of Eucharist, but at that time, mother of the church. Okay, and then the last one is Pentecost. And it's really a great time for us to be on retreat, right? In the Easter tide graces and all of the things we mentioned in the litany at the beginning of the day, yesterday actually. And But it's also a, a time where we have a meditation on Calvary that is a little bit different because uh, we're, we're looking forward to the time of Pentecost. 
other things are happening in the life of the church at that time. It's essentially the inauguration of the church at Pentecost. And so we're in this beautiful period where we can't stop celebrating. It's hard to celebrate for 50 days, but we can't really contain it in one day. And we see the world kind of closed down, even if it's a secular celebration with plastic eggs and, and, and rabbits and all those kind of things, it starts putting everything on clearance the next day, right? And it just gives us an opportunity to say, as a Catholic, I just can't contain all that happened over Holy Week and Easter in one day. It's just impossible. Who could? Well, what do you do then? Well, we celebrate for 50 days. What do you mean you celebrate for 50 days? Well, yeah, that's what we do. And we go all the way to Pentecost, and that's the inauguration of the church. So it's kind of a beautiful time to be on retreat because we're, we're in a place of celebration. And um, what a gift to the Lord that you're giving him to say, even in this time of celebration, I want to quiet myself and really appreciate what's happening here. And then by the time I reach Pentecost, it's really going to be a celebration. So it's a, it's a lovely time to, um, to give yourself uh, that gift, and it gives the church that gift as well. So Mary's contribution continues to be what it always has been at the Feast of Pentecost. Her contributions are faith, her faith that's unshakable, her faith that might have questions, but she's ready to give answers, and her gift of prayer. So her faith and prayer continue to be her hallmarks, her contributions, and also her ability and her ease of opening wide the door to the Holy Spirit in her life. So we see it uh, in the Annunciation, and then at Pentecost, big time. She's now, again, mother of the church, so the doors are really wide open. She's inviting the movement of the Holy Spirit in such a big way to the whole church. So the um, Pentecost miracle uh, features vitally in the Eucharist, in every Mass, the epiclesis, where we're inviting the Holy Spirit. Father talked about two epiclesis times, one where the priest is asking uh, for the Holy Spirit uh, to affect the elements that we're offering, and then also the epiclesis for the asking of the Holy Spirit upon all of us that are gathered there as the body of Christ. So uh, <clears throat> Mother Church says, let's make sure nobody misses this. So what happens? The bells ring. And if you're in a church where that happens and then you go somewhere else and it's just like, what happened there? <laughs> we missed something. But it helps us to be attentive, and I guess it puts us in a habit. If we're missing something, we must be attentive to what's happening. So beautiful ways that the church calls us into worship and then keeps us in this attitude of worship through the Mass, calling us, reminding us, and letting us know the consecration is just about ready to happen. So beautiful um, nurturings of Mother Church upon us. And again, Mary's present for all these things. This is the fourth Eucharistic prayer, and I think it's worth listening to. It's quite lovely. And a reminder that the Mass, the Eucharist itself, is the sacrament of unity. And, then, and Mary herself uh, is that mother who promotes unity. So this is the fourth Eucharistic prayer. Father, may this Holy Spirit sanctify these offerings. Let them become the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, as we celebrate the great mystery which he left us as an everlasting covenant. Lord, look upon the sacrifice which you have given to your church, and by your Holy Spirit gather all who share this one bread and cup into the one body of Christ, a living sacrifice of praise. That may sound familiar to you if the priest is saying this out loud. But again, it's pointing to, uh, at that time, the sacra sacrament is unifying, and um, we are a family that's coming together as one. So here it's, it's worth looking at a couple of paradoxes again, like we did earlier about uh, Mary and the Eucharist. This one, Mary, again, is God's creature 
yet she's also God's mother. So there's a quite a paradox here. How does that happen? How do we support that as a truth of the church? And but we do. Uh, Mary's also a member of the church, but she's also the church's mother. How do we reconcile that? Well, the church does. We believe it's both and. We believe that to be true. And so she's the model for us of, of what the church is in its inner self. She herself was Immaculata, the one without stain. And this is where we're headed. We're to be that church without blemish, without wrinkle. And so she is mother of the church. She is the one that will move us. She's helping to move us in that direction uh, for our final destiny. Um, so it's a beautiful uh, example of how uh, the church ha has us consider that both and aspect of these great truths. So... The Lord also has used Mary in dozens of apparitions. We talked a little bit about that just recently. And these continue to encourage us to toward prayer and the Eucharistic life, but also to help combat heresies. And many things uh, have been put into right order uh, due to the apparitions, due to the belief in the apparitions, the church's approval of them, the prayers that surround them, the Eucharistic celebrations that surround them, and heresies have been cut short. But she grieves deeply, doesn't she? Sometimes in the apparitions, Mary is weeping. And rightly so, because she's pleading with us. She uh, is not God, but uh, she's aware of more than, than we are. And so she has many return visitations with similar messages and similar tears. And not in just one spot of the world, but in various uh, locations. And I don't know if any of you have seen the maps that they now have of the world and all the places where Mary has appeared and how the, it's proliferated in our recent times. So we're always with an ear toward what uh, Mary's trying to help us with because again she's the mother of the church and the eucharistic life is that's uh, the eucharistic life within the church so the three main targets of attack by satan and his minions when he regards the church uh, is the church itself mary and the eucharist the priest is sort of in with the Eucharist, the, a priest is always under attack, but it's with the Eucharistic life. And they're all interrelated, and when one is attacked, the others suffer. And you can see that in the arc of history of the church, that when there's been a sag or an attack or uh, a lessening or a weakening of one area, the others suffer as well, right? So when there's a uh, not such a great um, faith or even belief in the Eucharistic life, well, the church is going to suffer and so is our life uh, with Mary. And so it goes with the other three as well. So one of the things I wanted to consider, and it kind of dovetails into the other things we've done, is I've spoken to you and given you testimonies of saints and also of um, priests and uh, lay women as well. What I thought I would do and would be maybe quite interesting is to give some testimonies related to the attacks on the church given by demons that were forced to confess these truths. And I think you're going to learn a little bit more about Mary and her relationship to the church and her relationship to the Eucharist. So these, again, the demons lie, but under the force of telling the truth, um, they, they, will, they will do that when an exorcist uh, forces them to tell the truth. And um, if you've read any kinds of things like this, a lot of times they scream and they try to wiggle out of uh, telling the truth because it's so painful. It's kind of us when we tell a little white lie, we might kind of squirm a little bit or our voice changes. 
I mean, when we do something that's not truthful, we react differently. So when the demons who are anti-truth uh, need to tell truth, it's very uh, painful for them. So again, this is just to underline that these are, are forced confessions about the Virgin Mary during uh, various uh, times in rites of exorcism. Mary is the terror of hell. She sovereignly loves mortal beings. Her love for mortals is, is inconceivable. She snatches away from us, that is the demons, more souls than all the angels and all the saints put together. Here's another voice of a, of a demon that was forced to speak the truth. I compare Mary to a formidable enemy, army, excuse me, formidable army. He who loves Mary is a friend of God. God is pleased with Mary. He gives evidence of that by never refusing one grace of all those that she asks of him. When a person prays to Mary, he does not do so with enough respect. One does not recognize that honoring Mary honors God, who made her as she is. Here's another one kind of speaking about Mary as creature and that the <clears throat> demon is spirit. And so he's ticked off because he's like, I'm higher. I'm a higher creature than she is. I'm created, but I'm higher. It says that other times in a disdainful tone, a demon manifested again his refusal to accept that the Virgin Mary was put over him through these expressions. This is what the demons are saying. She's only flesh. I am pure spirit. No, she is not. She's not over me. She's, she's not higher than me. What? You're saying she's higher than me? No, I am spirit. On another occasion, Responding with words already used in part before, a demon affirmed this. I rejected that she would be next to him. I could not bear that a human creature would be above me because I was the most beautiful angel. Beautiful, 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 the greatest. I was Lucifer, the angel par excellence. A couple more here. The woman, with an exclamation point, so much expression being told by this demon. For love of his children, she was created before all times in the thought of God. And as pure spirit, I cannot bear this, that putrid flesh. She is feared by us, not even with a thought. I did not undermine her even with a thought. No, not one, not one. Cursed, cursed be her. I was never able to touch her, though, because that one with the, always watched over her. There was always that one. It is not my fault. I was not able to touch her. I was afraid. Another time, one of the demons used kind of metaphorical language because he's talking about skin and, and brains, and the spirit does not have that, but I think we can get the gist of this. A demon said, every time that she, referring to Our Lady, descends onto earth, we sink even lower. Every one of her tears is a hole in our skin. Every one of her glances is a tearing of our brain. Every one of her steps is our end. We are looking to stop her, but we do not succeed because she is more powerful than us. Evil has no power over her. And then one more from a demon, and then I'm gonna have a quote from an exorcist here. One time the demon expressed the continual gratitude of Mary to God as follows. She always sings the praises of that one as she did before, but very few on earth are able to hear when she sings. Let's give the last word not to a demon, but to a priest. So this is um, 
now cardinal, well, he was, he's deceased now, but he was uh, made a cardinal, and it was um, Father Gabriel Amato, and maybe you've read his book on exorcisms. And um, he was the exorcist of Rome and wrote, I think, two books. The, I ordered one, and when I got it, I, I taped a, a, a St. Benedict medal to the back of it. <laughs> I don't want to have dreams. <laughs> but anyway, it's still on there. But anyway, he says, we have tools to dominate evil. Christianity is not a religion of discouragement. When we face evil that God allows, he helps us. We place our hope in him in trusting ourselves more to God in our weakness. And we entrust ourselves to Mary, sharing in her work of proclaiming God's victory over evil, always hoping and trusting in God's victory, our liberation in him. The key is to entrust ourselves to Jesus through Mary. Amen to that. So one final, uh, I guess, consideration is a handout that was handed out just a little while ago. Uh, again, this was something Father brought up in his tape about a dream of St. John Bosco. So again, we're going to, we kind of started with a little Visio Divina, and we're going to end with a little Visio Divina as well. Some of you may be familiar with this dream. St. John Bosco had several dreams over uh, for 60 years, and some of them uh, people term even visions. This one uh, is one that uh, has been around and been talked about a lot, and it has everything to do with what we talked about uh, today. So the vision that he had or the dream that he had uh, was that the church was like a ship, and you can see the church coming through, very big ship, uh, in the ocean, and it's taking refuge, it seems to be, between two pillars in the sea. And so he said, you can see on the, on your, on the right side of the picture, there's a pillar that's a little bit lower, and that's Our Lady. And she's got that blue sash that was talked about by St. Faustina, if you remember, right? And she's glowing. And then what's higher over to the right is the host, the Eucharistic Lord on that side. And these two pillars are kind of protruding a little bit forward, and the ship is, is kind of meeting it, coming from a distance, but coming toward it. And on the bottom of the uh, Our Lady is uh, the title Help of Christians. And if you remember from, from my testimony before, that was what I, I, I thought we should have, the title of Our Lady for the Seven Sisters, but it wasn't to be so. But it was to be so for this particular dream and this um, uh, uh, just an image of, of what the church, uh, where she should be. And then the host under, underneath that, I'm not sure you can read it, but it says the salvation of the faithful. Salvation of the faithful and help of Christians. So what's happening in this is the commander, you can see, is the Pope. It's a figure dressed like the Pope. And he's trying to direct all of his energies to steer the ship between the two columns, right? So there are enemy ships that are all around, and they're trying to attack the church. And the beautiful thing that was seen in this vision, it wasn't a still shot like this is. It was like, it was a dream. It was a, a motion. It was a, a motion picture, so to speak. And what was happening is when these deep gashes and holes were coming into the side of the church, uh, of the boat, which is the bark of St. Peter, um, this gentle breeze, it says, blew from the two columns, and the cracks just started to instantly close up. It was a protective nature to the Blessed Sacrament and to Our Lady. In this battle, though, the Pope was gravely wounded, his dream goes on to say, those around him tried to help him. A second time the Pope was struck, and this time he fell and he died. The new, a new Pope was promptly chosen, and those enemies surrounding him were kind of losing their sense that they were going to win a battle because everything was 
uh, put to back together so quickly and um, they started to lose their courage and so the new pope was overcoming these obstacles and uh, soliciting like the courage of the church but the ship still had to be guided between these two pillars of the host and of mary and so the, the there was a chain that was applied to the stern of the ship uh, to our lady and then the bow was attached to the host so you can see that then the, the church is anchored in these two things. And what happened was in this dream was something interesting, that some of these little ships started also anchoring themselves to the host and to Mary, uh, rather than attack. So uh, this particular reflection is by a priest who does a lot of uh, writing and reflections and maybe you've read some other things by Father Tommy Lane. But he then goes on to speak more about devotion to, to Jesus uh, in the Eucharist. And, and you're, you're welcome to read all of that. But it's a particular image that I think, again, uh, the bookends of our time together of having a, a vision and a, a deeper sense of who Mary is in the Eucharist. And then this um, image of John Bosco, of the two pillars that speaks something about the church and where she needs to stay in order to stay secure. So that I want to leave you with as well to meditate upon that too. There's a lot written on this particular one. This one I took a shorter kind of uh, uh, reflection on it, but investigate it. If it means something to you and you want to know more about it, please do. So as a very um, wrap up of what we're going to do today, I thought I would go to someone who is not a saint, maybe a saint in the making, but it's Mother Angelica. And I thought I would end our time with her. I think we can relate to her on so many levels and how she spoke and also her love of Our Lady in the Eucharist. So as an ending to this, and then we'll end with the glory be, here's what Mother Angelica says to you and to me. There are two things I want you to do. Keep close to our Lord in the Holy Eucharist and stay close to his mother. With these two loves, you will always have the light to see what is right and what is wrong, end quote. But then to further quote her, let's get cracking. <laughs> in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Good Counsel, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Or well, take any questions or <laughs> I could okay. Are, are we permitted to talk or we have to wait till <laughs> the meal yeah. blessing? No, that's fine. They can okay. So I guess like we can open it up for questions if you have any questions either about maybe something I said or about seven sisters. Okay. And then just a reminder that um Father so beautifully has a candle by the first class relic of St. John Vianney, so make sure that you visit and spend some time with him uh, and just uh, especially if you're a seven sister and take holy cards if you don't have any uh, other type of article touching it to a first class relic will of course make that uh, article or crucifix or metal uh, be a third class relic so the conduit it's not you know yeah. okay i was wondering um about this picture here uh-huh I don't. I don't know what it says. His father. <laughs> Take a look. Over. Stephen Barrett. 
it's like <laughs> no extra <laughs> charge <laughs> in Latin, <laughs> what, what was it behold the virgin will conceive and bear a son thank you thank the you for asking my the question. Diana, what if I have today? yeah um, the first time you were here, you um, mentioned divine economy several times. And okay. I, can you just tell me sure. more what that means, the yeah, divine so, economy? Yep. So I, somebody asked me that a little earlier, so that's oh. good. And uh, so the thing, the, the, the way I use it and the reason I use it is because it's, it's uh, like when we think of economics, it, it's something where it's on a paper and it's got it's got a finite. We have numbers. We can see graphs. We can, you know, it's, we see this. With God, divine economy is beyond that. It's the loaves and fishes. It's like that does not make sense that, you know, this would multiply into that. But in divine economy, everything's possible. And so it, it's it's not just on a physical level, but it's even like, multiplication of you know graces of the day or or just other understandings of things you know it's just like on my own i could not have understood that but in divine and divine economy and in, in that divine way it's possible that would be like the ocean yeah like the ocean would be divine Or just that it works outside of the bond, the binds of of the natural world. Oh, sure. Give something to add. <laughs> he didn't, re you know, say heresy or anything. So. <laughs> 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 Anybody else? Please help yourself to the holy cards and uh, other materials here, and thank you for your. Fidelity to prayer for priests, and I hope you're leaving uh, richer <laughs> from your time here. I certainly am. So, you have a couple minutes. Can you tell us actually how you got started? Um, sure. I, I'll try to do it in a nutshell. Probably okay. most of you have already heard this story so many times, but um, so I was praying for a priest on my own in a, in a holy hour in fact he's a priest that was in seminary in rome with father right so they know one another and um he was my my pastor which was the cathedral of saint paul and i just i i i had direction with him one day and i just was admirable uh to how generous he lived his priestly life and i i just felt like many of us do like with a sense of gratitude and I wanted something concrete to do. So I offered a holy hour for him and he didn't know. And I knew, and I knew I was called to do that. And I was happy to do that. And sometimes father would come in to the chapel and make a visit. And it was just a delight for me. I thought, I hope he's being edified because I just loving praying for him. And, um, so anyway, uh, I, probably did this for about nine months because I'm not thinking of starting anything or doing anything other than that. And then as I was praying for him one day, uh, not audible, but interiorly, uh, the word seven sisters came. And so I didn't know what that meant. I thought I misunderstood that it was seven sorrows chaplet. That's what I was supposed to be praying. So I reached for that. I bet it came a second time, but interiorly, not out loud. So it's one of the reasons that Seven Sisters is so fresh to me. I didn't name it. I think it's, I love the name. And my mother was one of seven sisters. So, you know, I was thinking, I wasn't thinking of her in the chapel at that time. But so it's something that people say, oh, you started. Well, the thing is, me alone would, could never start it because I, I need six others. <laughs> so really it was started uh, by Father Johnson's sense that it was something from the Holy Spirit. But he said, we need to test the spirits. So he, he had a plan to have seven groups of seven women pray for one year and then uh, go back and see what happened. So we started in 2011 uh, at the, on the Solemnity of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and then went for uh, another a year. And in 2012, 
I went and visited these seven um, places. Well, I was one of the places, but visited with the women, the intercessors. And it was, it was just amazing. I mean, there was just, it was so, um, the testimonies were so unbelievable. And so I'm writing everything down and, and I reported it to father. And he says, well, let's just open the door and see what happens. And so in 2012, in June, so 10 years ago, uh, in June, uh, we opened the doors. And um, now there's uh, 3,000 groups, of at least seven. A lot of groups have more than seven. Bishop groups have 21. And there's a lot of fruit of the apostle. We have fasting brothers are groups of men that fast alongside for the priest. The neat story is that there's a place, uh, I think it's in New Hampshire, but I can't remember for sure. But anyway, the, the parochial vicar is one of the fasting brothers for the pastor. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> so he fasts for his pastor. And um, there's just, it's just so many beautiful things. We have a appreciated and loved quilt project. So um, uh, the idea behind that is to supply quilts for retired priests and priests that are ailing. So I think we've issued about 19 of them in our archdiocese and three of them in North Dakota. So, and there was one in Nebraska too. Yeah, that was given to a priest who passed away. So, yeah, so the idea behind that is that it's like a double cloaking of prayer and quilt. And she's only one person, so. Well, she has a group of people, but she might, she probably made yours, but yeah. Oh, okay. She's it, she cuts it, but she has other people. She's still amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So then kind of, I just, just as a last thing, I can just say that, uh, as another fruit of the apostolate, something again that Father Johnson came out of his heart uh, was uh, a year ago, he said to me, uh, there's so many priests in crisis and we know women are willing to pray and we need women to pray for priests in crisis. So he, he called it an SOS group. And I says, okay, I don't doubt that, but I don't like that name. <laughs> he, he's like, that's fine. He said, pray about it, see what you come up with. So I prayed about it, and um, what, we, what we came up with was uh, Elijah's helpers. So Elijah was always under a lot of fire, right? So he just, he just had quite a life. But there were always helpers along the way. So uh, what it is, it's a group of seven sisters that prays for priests in general, priests that are in crisis. Maybe it's a, it's a crisis of the moment. He, he goes to the mirror to shave, and maybe it's just like, I just can't do this one more, you know, it's just the day. But it could be priests with, a, you know, more uh, chronic or more uh, severe type of crisis of whatever type. We don't know the names of the priests, and we don't know what uh, type of crisis they're in. But we know that there, something's happening every day. So what happened was when it opened up, we got so much response that we actually have 21 women praying. So we have three holy hours every day for these priests in crisis. And um, the interesting thing is the, the person that um, is it started it, she was an anchoress for another priest, and she really had a great relationship with this priest. She says, I just, I, I will pray about it, but I really would like to stay being anchoress for, for Father, you know. But prayer really led her to be the, the anchoress for this. And she really is the perfect person for this. She's so prayerful, so organized, and she is the best person for this job. And so she's, she called me and she said, we're just getting all these responses, but we don't have anybody for Friday. So I said, I can pray like temporarily, but I'm already praying in two seven sister groups and other things in life. And I says, I, I can do it temporarily but I will do it. Well, it turned out we started on Friday, the Solemnity of the Sacred Heart. So when I went, I went with my husband, we went together for this hour, and it was an amazing hour. And I thought, well, of course I'm supposed to be starting. I mean, it, I really need to have a heart for priests in crisis. So I really cried most of that hour because I felt so um, humble that, and kind of non-generous about, you know, saying I'm only gonna do it temporarily. <laughs> So now I'm I'm just hooked on this hour. I just I love this hour. It's uh, it's just uh, 
a great hour. And um, so now we're opening it up. So places that have coordinators, so Lincoln and Omaha are both dioceses uh, that have uh, coordinators for volunteer coordinators for the apostolate. Uh, they will be uh, reaching out to see if people want to start it in your diocese. So, so we're going to be doing that in all the dioceses with uh, with coordinators, and there's about 48 dioceses with coordinators. So, so they'll hopefully be praying for a lot of priests that are in crisis and maybe saving um, some of these vocations to stay healthy. And but we don't know names or anything like that. If 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 something's public, of course. You know, a, a woman can pray about that, but it's never to seek more information. It, it really is. And so this is all part of how it's going to be presented to people that would agree to do this. Yeah, but no names, no initials, nothing other than what is already public. So. How many, many groups do you have across the country? How many groups? Well, yeah, I don't know. It's, well, we have six continents, 25 countries. Every state in the United States has at least three groups, and um, m most have many more, but the lowest number is three. And then most provinces in Canada are covered too. Yeah, so. That's part of it. Exactly. Six in Hong Kong, we have six groups in Hong Kong. Right now we have a lot of action in Cameroon. It's these sisters are there. A sister came to Minneapolis St. Paul and she was at a dinner at somebody's house. She started talking about praying for priests and she got the book out. She took it back to Cameroon and all these groups are starting. And there are groups that are in the bush. And these these some are sisters, some are teachers, and they they have WhatsApp and that's how they they communicate. It's really it's really cool. They have three bishops covered there already, and this is just meant to be so. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You mentioned something about how the Pope is coming. How the Pope? Okay, so the Pope, so Father Johnson, he's the guy with all the ideas. You see what I mean about him? I said, you're you're the guy who sparked an international movement. <laughs> and he always says, no, 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 it was just in my poverty, you know, you felt sorry for me. And I said, but anyway, he's, he's such a creative soul. And so he said, Jeanette, I want to have seven groups for the Pope. And I'm, and he goes, and one on every continent. And I'm like, Father. I go, well, there is already one group, and it's in, like, uh, Iowa or something. And then he goes, well, just, like, put it out there and, and ask for that to happen. Well, it, it didn't happen on different continents, but we have eight groups for the Pope. So the, the apostolate gives Pope Francis eight holy hours every day as a gift. And then um, one day I was looking online at some pictures and I saw Pope Benedict returning from his visit to his brother who was ailing. Remember that two years ago or something? And I looked at him and I thought, why don't, why doesn't he have a seven sister group? <laughs> so I put it out in the communique, which is a monthly uh, thing that comes out from the apostolate. And I got seven people immediately. I think I got eight actually. So we have a sub, but, um, so I'm in that group as well because I didn't I didn't think I was going to be in that, but it, again, it was a sense of not only are you going to have a group, but I got this sense, and you're going to be in it. <laughs> so it, it's been a great uh, blessing for me. I pray for Pope Benedict on Sunday. And so, um, yeah, I always leave that hour feeling like he's prayed for me <laughs> the whole time. So, yeah. so thanks for asking that question because we do support the, the Pope. Do you do weekly or daily holy hours? Do I? I don't. I I I I am in three groups. So I'm in a Thursday, Friday, and Sunday group. Yeah. So. There's like one change you've noticed about yourself. Me personally, me personally, yeah. There's so many, really. Um, I, 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 I really believe, and I, I talk about it in the guidelines booklet. Like when I started to do this, I kind of felt like, oh, I know how to pray, and um, you know, I was a, 
Protestant for 10 years, right? No, I mean, you just kind of have a sense of like, well, I, I, I can do it. I can pray for an hour. That's something I've done many times. But it was a very humbling experience the very first time I went because I thought, oh, this is new. This is praying for one person and really praying as God uh, desires it to be prayed. It was very humbling from that very first day. And so I felt like I, I entered school in the goo goo gaga stage <laughs> and i still feel that way sometimes it's just like so we have three patrons that help us and um of course we're before the blessed sacrament so but yeah i think i think it's a realization that um, i'm just in the beginning of learning how to communicate do you always do a rosary no, not always. No, no, it really is a Holy Spirit inspired mm -hmm. thing. One time I felt so compelled to pray the Stations of the Cross for Pope Benedict. And I thought he was going to, I thought I was going to get word he had died or something because I, I just was so compelled to get up in this church. It was kind of during COVID times. And so we were in a big, a bigger church, not a littler sanctuary. And so I walked all the way around the church and it was just, it was, I thought, wow. It's in, I think it was the year of St. Joseph, and I thought, oh, he's going to go in, in his namesake year and all that stuff. But yeah, so I, I really try to go and just be open. To teach. But, and maybe somebody else has testimonies that as a sister. Yeah. Well, I'll just share my own. I've been uh, in Chris now for so many years for the bishop's master of ceremony position at the and initially, what it would look like is I was very, I have to read all these prayers. I have to read all these prayers for the priest, and that was the holy hour, reading the prayers. And that has changed in the last probably 18 months. And I don't know why. Uh, it's not for me to ask the priest why, but it's pretty much during the whole hour, please bless and place Father pretty much the whole time that's what it's in front of the Eucharist. So it just like that's really the ideal. That's Spirit. really what we go for. Yeah. Perfect. And we've gotten some other booklets and stuff that I've handed out to some of the other uh, yeah. teachers that that pretty much sits on the chair next to me and it's me begging for graces from them the whole time. It's however the Spirit wants. I like to do too the divine mercy, and I always do the scripture. Okay. But scripture do, rosary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I do the prayers in the book. Yeah. I'm yeah. doing it eight or nine times. Yeah. We had a coffee hour together. Um, together before. Made a comment, and I found this very encouraging. She said that we cannot spend 52 hours Just, it's, I think it's human nature sometimes that we say, Father, does this count? You know, like if we've gone to a mass, yeah. it's like, Father, does this count? I mean, I just, we want it to be, we want to be right, we want it to, to fit, but at the same time, um, it kind of stunts our generosity sometimes too, and um, it's a, it's a, it's a good point because I think that some women um, they're able bodied and they do a lot of other things, but they really want to do the prayer at home, and so it it could be that there's just uh, this little spiritual attack coming to them, uh, but we always try to just like just just get yourself there, dip your hand in the holy water, and things will be better. And then the testimonies over and again, over and again, just say it is worth every effort to get there. And once you get there, just as what you're saying, it's different being in front of the Blessed Sacrament, which you can be in front of the tabernacle too, which is still of the Blessed Sacrament. But um, yeah. And with all that said, we do have homebound sisters that are very faithful to the hour that are not able to get out, but they feel called. To the apostolate and they're faithful to pray and many of them offer their sufferings 
So, wow, that's a huge um, offering for the priests. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the things for me, because I'm just working, is you have no idea. I mean, you're praying for them, so you know it helps, but um, you think you don't know. I mean, you don't know what the struggle really is exactly. with the priests. I mean, you know. You know, unless they make public comments, you don't know. So I always wonder, <laughs> is this doing any good? Because I don't know. I don't and that's know. part of learning, isn't it? It's like, well, maybe we don't even have to wonder that anymore. We just, we just say, yeah. Jesus, I trust in you. You know, I'm not, I'm not going against what you're saying, but I, I felt the same way. But, but maybe that's the maturing that he's asking. In the beginning, you know, when this came and the word seven sisters and I said to Father Johnson, what about the men? You know, it's just like as a natural, it's like people are going to ask about the men. I'm asking about the men. And Father said, seven sisters really speaks about women. Maybe the Lord is doing a work in the women right now. And it was just, just such a perfect word. And, and maybe that's it. I mean, maybe somehow we, we affect a lot in the church. But we need to affect it with positive. The very when I said I went around like St. Paul and Father said go around like St. Paul and see what's happening in these little places. The very first comment that came back to me from a woman was um, she started to cry, and then she said after she gained her composure she said, "I am a person that used to backbite priests, and I I kind of was part of this group because it was like you know like a good thing, but she said I'm different after one year, I'm different." And I'm the first one to defend a priest at the coffee clutch, right? But she was able to admit in her humility, maybe because of the change that was afforded her in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And when I went home that day, I'm like, Lord, what was that? That was the very first comment I heard. What about the priest being more at peace? The priest, you know, fill in the blank. His homilies are so power packed, all this <laughs> stuff. But it was about her. And then it just hearkened to what Father said, maybe the Lord is doing a work in the women. Now, fasting brothers have been folded in, and it's, it's, it's happy. But men can sub in. My hu husband, we generally go together, so those hours, um, both Benedict and the, our priests, uh, they get two hours. So, But it's helped our marriage. We love going, and we stay extra, and... Um, we talk about how much more we love our pastor together. You know, it's like one of us was praying and kind of gaining this sense of love. For, but we're doing it together, and it's, it, it really, yeah. So, yep. I was just going to say, um, I think he complains a lot about worship. So I asked him to be the fasting brother. <laughs> and I gave him the, the form, the little connection yeah. that you could take it. I said, Don't pray about it. Make it back to me. And he did. Okay. And then uh, I was traveling on Thursday, so I, I made sure it was the hour mark. That's okay. Yeah. But it's. Uh, we, we had a group that was fasting for the sisters, you know, and they were loving it. But then it was like, oh, no, they, you got to fast for the priest, you know, but, you know it all works. I, I don't know if I scared people wrong, but when we had our first meeting with a deacon's wife, she has, isn't able to get out like three months a year. She kind of stays in because of lung problems. So I told her, you can go live adoration on your phone. And so she does that, but when she can, she goes to yeah, church. Well, then perfect. I had COVID in January. And so my four weeks, I had live adoration from EWT in the chapel of my kitchen. I didn't do my adoration hour, but I did that. I figured it counts. <laughs> and divine economy. Yeah. It works. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I try to, yeah, and I never weigh in either, like I always let anchoresses, I say, you know your people, I don't know your people, so, you know, and some anchoresses have said, this lady goes out a lot, and she just doesn't want to do her prayer out, 
but so then she'll you know she makes the decision not me because I, I can't make a decision about people's intercessors but 